Hey, this is Lee Green, and I'm the host of the Steroid to CEO podcast, a new show brought to you by Future Commerce. Tune in to Stairway to CEO to hear unfiltered interviews with inspiring founders and business leaders from all over the world. We dive into their entrepreneurial journey, starting from childhood, to uncover the hardships, failures, and tough lessons learned that got them to where they are today. We're publishing new episodes every Tuesday, and you won't want to miss it. So don't forget to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, or check us out at futurecommerce.fm slash stairway to CEO. That's futurecommerce.fm slash stairway to CEO. Future Commerce is brought to you by Vertex. Vertex Cloud is for businesses of all sizes, from small and medium-sized businesses all the way to enterprise. You can find out how Vertex can help your business by visiting them online at vertexcloud.com slash future commerce. Future Commerce is brought to you by Omnisend. Omnisend is way more than just email marketing. Drive more sales and combine more channels with one platform. Learn more about Omnisend today at omnisend.com slash future commerce. Future Commerce is brought to you by Gladly. What if customer service could feel like a conversation between friends? Well, Gladly is a radically personal customer service platform that puts people... Yes, people at the center of a single lifelong conversation. By enabling B2C companies to focus on people talking to people, Gladly powers a lifetime of conversations across every channel, from phone, email, text, chat, and social media. See what a truly customer-centered platform looks like today at gladly.com slash future commerce. Hello and welcome to Future Commerce, the podcast about cutting edge, cutting edge, Brian, and next generation <laughs> commerce. I'm Philip. And I'm Brian. Brian. This, <laughs> Brian. This is like our first episode, just the two of us in a very long time. Since probably nine by nine. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, is that, is, that, is that what we do now? This episode, by the way, uh, will be a gratuitous patting of the back of ourselves of how good we did on our last report. So uh, <laughs> get ready, 45 minutes. Uh, Do you no, realize we only come together on these episodes now to congratulate ourselves? It's like, true. That's, it's like the only reason we talk to each other. Now. Before we congratulate ourselves, there are so many other things we could congratulate ourselves about, by the way. I, although I am very proud of our Retail Rebirth report. And by the way, we will be talking about Retail Rebirth today, eventually. Um <laughs> But uh, uh, if you want to follow along with us, you can go download the report right now. Go get it. It's at futurecommerce.fm slash retail rebirth. So, and uh, well, go on. <laughs> this air, will this air after you run 40 miles for your 40th birthday? Yes, that's true. Can, yes. Yes. I'm going to pre congratulate you now. Thank you. Congratulations, Philip. Turn don't, 40. Don't run in 40. <laughs> I feel like you're, 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 jinxing me in some way um i think this airs afterwards right right okay i'll take the pre-congratulations how's that <laughs> i'm taking I, I appreciate it i'm running 40 miles on my 40th birthday uh yes it will all be in one go <clears throat> you say yes you are running you mean you have run yes you so have when already you, by run. the time you listen to this uh yeah you know it's interesting i i decided to take this on so I've had people ask me, like, do you walk at all? Yes, I walk. <laughs> it's 40 miles. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you have to walk sometimes because your body just doesn't agree with you in the running of 40 miles. It just stops working. Um, so, uh, and things happen, by the way. It's going to take about nine hours to eight, eight and a half to nine hours to get done. You have to eat. I have to take in 200 calories an hour. Do you know how hard it is to consume 200 <laughs> calories every hour while you're actively running brian it's like just so, like people out there on the sides of the street handing you beef jerky that's like right, you're having just, beef, <laughs> drive by beef jerky, jerky. <laughs> i've got like beef jerky aid stations 
Um, you know what? You, this, you should feel pretty good because it took me about eight hours to do about 10 miles recently. But oh, then yeah, again, you... I was doing some elevation. So congratulations, dude. You, yeah. you did no, like it's half not a, a Rainier or something. No, 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 no. This is not a congratulations kind of hike. This was a fun day hike up to Camp Muir, which is on Mount Rainier. Not the same thing as scaling Mount Rainier. You can congratulate me someday when I do scale Mount Rainier. Well, uh, but, I believe uh, pre-congratulations are in order, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I pre-congratulate you for this thing. Uh, I really hope this airs well before I summit Rainier. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would, I believe it will because it's slated to come out in the next like three days. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea actually when this publishes. We are talking about retail rebirth. We're, we'll get there. Um, a bunch of things have happened that we uh, like. I I just I have to. If you're listening to Future Commerce or you have been listening for a while, uh, you'll know that we are on our game. If I do say so myself, <laughs> <clears throat> we are. We're incredible. I'm like I'm truly amazed at how often we are correct. <laughs> I know we warned laughing. you up front. We warned you up front. This was a self congratulatory episode. It like. really is. <laughs> it really is. And it will, it will continue to be. Um, it's, 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 I, I don't know. I just, I can't, I can't get over the fact that every now and then, uh, like we, we just hit it on, we just hit it on the nose. I don't know. Um, okay. So, uh, there's a, comp- there's a bunch of things. Why? Um, we were talking uh, some time ago about um, education. Uh, we, we had written a piece uh, called uh, The New Formal, which I felt like was uh, really, really interesting. Um, right before The New Formal came out, you wrote a piece about... Um, uh, maximalism. Maximalism. Well, well it, that was one dimension. economy, yeah. art, all of the above. <laughs> and it, was, it was like the new... It was called The New Dada, and it was how Dadaists are very contrarian right um Mm -hmm. and and utilize art to uh you know to make statements about things yes correct and and how those things are sort of reactionary so the original dadaists were uh, a a a reaction to like the bourgeoisie and the um you know and the uh, uh sort of like opulence of england and france and uh and how maximalism would be a reaction to the you know the current minimalism or the like the prior generation's minimalism and nordic minimalism like you said this very specifically in this piece it's called the new dada um yeah hopefully we link it up in the show notes (laughs) it's not always guaranteed um (laughs) uh and we got this right there was actually a piece that that fell uh not so long after this uh I believe it was in The New Yorker. The New Yorker had a piece about yep. Gigi Hadid and Drake's homes sort of being this ode to maximalism. It's pretty uh, cool, actually, the, you know, their they, house. <laughs> it's very cool looking. I mean, it can be done in such a, a beautiful way. Kyle uh, Cheka, mm-hmm. who I follow on Twitter, uh, wrote a piece that basically like, uh, kind of kind of says all the things that we said, but obviously <laughs> better because they write for The New Yorker. Um, but yeah, trend spotting, we're, we're, we're hundred percent on it. We're, 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 we're on top of them. Very proud of us. More to come and, on that too. Yeah. Actually, maybe it's already out by now. <laughs> uh, you, you, we need to stop trying to do the, <laughs> we need to stop trying to do the, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, that whatever it is you're doing right there is very confusing. It uh, is. So anyway, um, retail rebirth actually is, is such an interesting piece because I feel like we, it was, we, we were on top of uh, the trend spot there as well. So we actually, when did we conceive Retail Rebirth? So this would have been probably four months ago. So roughly. April or May. Little, yeah, roughly, yeah, probably like uh, April um, yeah. as we were coming out of March. So um, we, we created this report. Um, we, we actually began work on Retail Rebirth uh, simultaneously as we were finishing up 9 by 9 yeah. And uh, the idea or the premise as we had originally sort of conceived it, um, and, and I can actually read from our uh, our abstract, which is kind of nice that we can do these things now. 
Uh, our original <laughs> creative brief for Retail Rebirth was that there would be a new seasonality, like a new retail seasonality, and the rhythm of retail has been disrupted. Uh, you probably heard this if you heard the uh, that jazz that jazz concept piece that we did that announced Retail Rebirth. Uh, it said all of this stuff. And it said, you know, purchasing patterns have been shifted around. Retailers are going to spend much of the next 18 months trying to persuade customers to return to normal. And the report is going to inform, what re, you know, what that new normal is to retailers and how consumers are preparing for their future, how merchants can adapt their strategy for success to grow their business. And yeah, I, we, uh, we, you know, partnered with uh, Method and Mode again, and we did some broad consumer research. We did some qualitative with, uh, uh, you know, business operators uh, in our Future Commerce Expert Network. And we found a lot of really, really interesting themes. And that's what Retail Rebirth is all about. We, we, we teased out five themes. And uh, it, I, I think it's one of our best reports yet. I'm really proud oh, of it. Oh, for sure. Uh, I, my, one of my favorite parts of the report is just the artwork. It's super fun. I, it's like we, we had some visions for this and it really turned out like right in line with how, like I had it in my mind that it would mm -hmm. turn out. And so it's really pretty report. So anyway, it's, it's fun to read. At least I found it fun to read. <laughs> yeah. It's a really great read actually. And you know, like, you know, us, uh, it's, it's <clears throat> not short. <laughs> it's like 14 pages long. <laughs> Um, it's, it's not a quick read. And I think that, you know, you get your money's worth there in that, you know, you trade your, you trade an email for, <laughs> you trade some contact information, uh, for, I think some really deep, uh, retail research insight. Um, one thing that came out in, in talking about this. So our new creative director who, uh, we just brought onto the team, uh, Jesse Tyler, uh, who joined us actually helped pitch in for this report. And one of the early concepts was, that environmentally, like a bunch of environmental factors that are happening right now are things that have happened actually in the past. These, these are things that have intersected before. Uh, protests, um, social justice movement, um, an election year, a public health crisis. Uh, these are all things that happened uh, once before, and it was 1968. And there's a bunch of things that happened mm -hmm. that year that actually created an environment that set up a whole, you know, that set up three decades of innovation afterwards. Uh, so without getting too deep in like reading the report to you, uh, a few things that like converged in that moment in 1968 was, well, uh, Douglas Engelbert had the mother of all demos, which was that computer, uh, the, the online system that, that demoed what the personal computer was to become. Also, the whole Earth catalog uh, was launched by Stuart Brand, who actually happened to be a non-technical collaborator for that mother of all demos um, uh, 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 event. And Stuart Brand uh, developed the first whole Earth catalog, which you might have said is like an analog precursor to Amazon.com. And all of that moment and that turmoil of the 60s and the early 70s actually gave birth to what you know we know now as the information age and the uh, the proliferation of personal computing and having information at your fingertips. And so if that moment in all of its turmoil could give birth to a great age of innovation, what could this moment in all of its turmoil give birth to? That is retail rebirth in a nutshell. And there are five concepts that we believe will help you position your business to take advantage of what this is, which is at the beginning of a new cycle. How's that for an yeah. intro? That was pretty good. Uh, that's a good intro. And there, these five takeaways, we're going to cover in some detail here. Um, and I think the first one, um, which we, we kind of laughed about, uh, is, is the power of American optimism. And so this is one of the biggest, like most astounding things about the data that we saw come in. And that is that people are not too concerned about the future, <laughs> which blew our minds. Like yeah. going into this, Philip and I were both like, okay, like, you, you know, right now people have some money, but they've got to be thinking out like ahead of stimulus packages and looking at, you know, ahead to the end of the year when, you know, unemployment's going to start to run out and like, will things start to bounce back? And like, we're like, at least people might be a little bit nervous about this. <laughs> yeah, I, you but would the, think 
<laughs> but yeah. you would be wrong. <laughs> you would be wrong. Yes, and, exactly. And, you know, we we had some of this too. Uh, you know, again, one of the one of the takeaways or one of the the feedback items, and I think it's just a twenty. Like this is twenty twenty in a nutshell. But mm-hmm. anything that takes any sort of amount of time to produce uh, starts to it takes on the air of the moment in which <laughs> the question is asked. Right? Like you ask people a question in the middle of April or uh, early May. And by the time, you know, end of June comes around for you to put out the printed report, uh, that consumer sentiment may have shifted. In this case, like it doesn't seem like it shifted at all. Like they, uh, <laughs> Consumers are just fairly optimistic about where they are right now uh, in relation to where they've been and how much better off they'll be by the end of the year. So a couple takeaways, uh, you know, even though we're coming up on an election, even though, you know, we're in the middle of a second wave of coronavirus and even though uh, our, you know, one step forward, two steps back, uh, phased reopenings, uh, school, back to school, question mark. Um, even though all that's happening, still uh, 48% of Americans polled in our nationally representative survey said that they will be in pretty much the same position financially at the end of the year as they are right now, which this was at H, you know, the beginning of H2 2020. Um, only 23% said they'd be worse off. 30% say they'd be in a better situation. I have a hard time believing that that is going to be the case. I, I have no idea where I'm going to be at the end of the year. And, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, dependent on fiscal stimulus, um, to make those ends meet. I think it's going to be a really interesting, uh, few months ahead of us. And, you know, listen, the majority uh, that we polled said uh, that, you know, they do not expect things to be continuing in a downward trajectory, despite all of the other evidence that might, you know, point to the the contrary, which I think is just super interesting. Yeah, so no, that's not American only, optimism. <laughs> not, not only are consumers optimistic, I think even e-com operators that we polled um, from our experts network yeah, were also operators. Yeah. a little bit more... <laughs> a little bit more optimistic than I think we even expected. Um, And 60% said they were on track to hit their revenue goals for 2020. Uh, That's, I mean, obviously there's, there's the other 40% that that aren't on track, but, but it was even more than like, especially at the time when we first started doing this research and we're not seeing like the absolutely insane move towards e-commerce that we've seen recently. Yeah. Um, and 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 the and the move in retail like one percent up over year over year for what was it June June that we were up one percent year over year which yeah. I thought would have been th- like the worst month to be up year over year. Um, yeah, there was uh, it was it was actually um, I, I I don't have that number in my back pocket. I felt like yeah. it, it might have been two percent, uh, but we comped up over yes. last year's. Uh, uh, monthly retail sales, which is the number I think that you're quoting from the Commerce mm-hmm. Department, the U.S. Commerce Department, um, and that we comped up. Uh, and a lot of the sort of guidance that was given around that number that came out at the time from, you know, some banks is that, well, that's propped up by stimulus. And, you know, we're looking now at quarterly earnings from Walmart and Target. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe it is propped up by stimulus. <laughs> uh, Walmart had like a 200% growth in e-commerce during uh, Q2 uh, Lowe's tar- up 135. <laughs> Insane. Target, yeah. you know, had a uh, a record quarter uh, as well, and so yeah, it's it's an incredible uh, incredible surge that have gone to uh, those businesses. So, you know, something we had talked about a lot during those early quarantine like reopenings, um, as states were starting to reopen, um, uh, was a phenomenon that had popped up of folks that went shopping because there was nothing else to do. Like you were stuck at home. The only thing you could do is maybe go to Target or go to Walmart. There was nothing else open because they were considered essential. And you're sort of like mindless wandering around the aisles at Target, you know, picking up a couple extra things, I think did contribute to uh, improvement in uh, in retail sales numbers, at least during Q- Q2. Well, now that there's other things to do, when when you look at places where businesses say that they're planning to drive revenue in 2020, uh, based on our survey, uh, business operators, you know, have already spent like 68% of them have already invested in identifying new customers. 
So they're probably going to spend a lot less time there. Only 27% say that they're going to, you know, planning to identify new customers. Uh, of, of all the things that we asked, which there were a number, um, only 5% plan to make additional staff cuts or layoffs, which is shocking. Unbelievable. So they've either yeah. cut it already or they didn't, they didn't, you know, or they decided not to, um, in, in, uh, you know, in and decided to put their efforts into other things. So rather than cost cutting, they're learning, they're looking to try to drive additional revenue, which I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, I think that I think that that is uh, again just goes back to that power of American optimism. I, I have a feeling, and maybe this is just the the you know the sample that we drew, drew from, which was our expert network, which is full of incredible people. But I wonder if maybe the cuts are coming from different parts of the business. That's that's the only thing I can think of that maybe is a little bit of an outlier here is the types of people that we pull are are maybe more focused on on acquisition than they are on like bean counting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so. Um, that's the, my, maybe one addendum to it, to it. But I, I really believe that this is, this is really like a reflective of, of how we view business in America. And I think that, you know, sometimes our optimism can actually pull us out of a, a, a hole. And There's so, the, so that's a really interesting point. Uh, and, and something that I, I think that we, we probably discount here and, or, or we don't say it very explicitly in the report, which is. I think to be optimistic to some degree is to be human. Uh, it is uniquely human, I believe, to be, uh, to look in your, the, like, to see the hope or the opportunity even in your present circumstance. It's the thing that has made at least this country uh, the land of opportunity, right? And uh, it's the thing on which we've built in, in the United States the uh our economic model and the uh you know the ability that you know most people have despite uh you know despite uh you know just there are environmental challenges certainly don't want to put those uh, aside i know that there is systemic racism there are things that uh have held people down especially certain people groups um but when you compare us with, you know, the despotic government of, say, like, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, People's Republic of China um, or the, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, we have a little bit of a different economic system that provides more opportunity for more people. Um, yeah. And we are very like we, you know, that that's something that's come through in this report in a big way. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are widening the aperture. We, we uh, I'm not sure uh, now you've got me thinking about when this podcast will come out. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca Boxall of Native Shoes is is going to give uh, a more global perspective uh, from the Native Shoes brand uh, and what, you know, like how they think about it globally and what their experience has been like in battling this time. And, you know, it sounds like they have a very optimistic take on the way that they're, you know, pivoting and uh, serving more customers during this time and raise it, you know, rising to the challenge as well. But that's the first point, you know, as per usual, we spend way more time on the first point than all the others. Um, Point number two, Brian. What what is point number two? So on digital comes of age again, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that it's it's interesting. You know, we we look back, um, you know, at the the early two thousands and and uh, the the bubble that happened there, and like we were we were kind of all like all of the companies that tried to, to do e commerce then were were maybe a little ahead of the curve, right? And there was a big bubble around it, and no one was ready to do it. And the thing is, this time around, we hit a big challenge, not the stock market crash, not the, the bubble of, of, you know, vaporware, but we hit um, COVID <laughs> and everyone's stuck at home. And so actually, all of a sudden, e-commerce becomes the preferred method for people to make purchases. Mm-hmm. This is this is the this is the opportunity and this is this position we find ourselves in where uh brick and mortar used to be like the end all to be all of retail where the the highest of high experiences the most amount of money was put into flagship stores and these physical experiences and and uh, Philip wrote a phenomenal article uh, for Future Commerce Insiders, um, uh, which he he made a great reference to the movie Freaky Friday, where there's a body swap, 
uh, uh, where, you know, the mom becomes the mom or the daughter and the daughter becomes the mom. Well, all of a sudden we're in a situation now where digital is now the preferred experience and people are are, are afraid and uncomfortable going out into stores and making purchases there. This gives e-commerce the opportunity to become what it could become. And now digital is your flagship. That is your number one place to invest. If you are getting, if we're on a trajectory to see 50% of our sales come through digital, then your digital experience better be the best experience that you offer your customers. Um, yeah. And so that is what we're heading into now. This is, the, this is Retail Rebirth in a nutshell. <laughs> Future Commerce is brought to you by Vertex. Vertex Cloud is the automation platform for tax calculation and use tax and everything in between for businesses of all sizes. From SMB all the way to enterprise, businesses all over the world trust Vertex for their tax calculation needs, and you should too. Check them out today at vertexcloud.com slash future commerce. OmniSend is one platform to control all of your marketing channels. From marketing automation, SMS, and email, to forms and segmentation, you can bring together different channels under one platform with OmniSend. OmniSend's powerful platform allows you to link together every customer touch point with one dashboard. And did I mention, they have the most transparent pricing in the entire MarTech industry. Find out why brands like Fred Siegel and Unilever trust OmniSend with their customer relationships. Find out more about OmniSend today at omnisend.com slash future commerce. Gladly is a radically personal customer service platform. Gladly gives customer service teams the ability to treat their customers like people. From knowing their last purchase, their dress size, or even their child's upcoming birthday, all before ever saying hello. Built for the way that people communicate today, a customer and their history are never parted within Gladly. And all conversations across all channels are all contained under a single conversation thread to give agents, the real heroes here, the tools that they need to deliver exceptional customer service experiences. Gladly works with some of the most innovative brands in the world, helping them to deliver a more powerful and more personal experience for their customers. Some of those customers are JetBlue, Toomey, Joanne, Godiva, and Native Shoes, and maybe even you. Don't wait. Find out today what a radically personal customer service platform is all about. Visit gladly.com slash future commerce to learn more. And by the way, uh, of the business uh, sec- uh, sector in, in the e-commerce vertical that are part of our Future Commerce Expert Network, uh, which by the way, if you would like to join our expert network, uh, go to futurecommerce.fm and sign up for uh, Future Commerce Insiders, which is our uh, weekly essay. Join that community. The welcome email will give you some uh, information on how to join the expert network. Uh, but the expert network weighed in and they 61% of them said they are sh- shifting business funding to their website. So six, 61% are looking to spend more on their e-commerce site where 30% said they would hold the same. Only 9% said they were looking to spend less online. And those are likely ones that were probably over leveraged or on a legacy platform that's, you know, costing uh, a lot more money. Um, you know, one thing and that they're... you and I have seen in the agency space is that you can have renewed interest in e-commerce and be putting more manpower and effort into having a better e-commerce experience, but be spending less overall. Yes, and, totally. Uh, and, and that's because the, the modernity of e-commerce platforms allows you to put more resources in-house, rely on less outside agency help, uh, drive more uh, you know, results with fewer people. And that is, like, that is the, the efficiency of that channel that is beginning to put the power into the hands of the operators. Something if we talked a lot a, about last year. Um, yeah. If, if you, you are, are on, on a legacy, le- legacy e-commerce platform right now, uh, it, 
the, to me, careful you, what like, you say. <laughs> I'm very scared about what you're about to say. No, to me, like <laughs> you, you need to make a move to something that makes sense for your business. Uh, there's That's, a, yeah, but here's here's the here's the rub, right? Like, if 61 percent are spending more on their website or e-commerce, um, I I believe that there's this there's a, a a shift that needs to happen there in that they need to be putting the money towards the right things because you can certainly yes. spend money on the wrong things online in e-commerce and bells and whistles and, and sort of dig a, a deeper hole for yourself. I, I think it's less about feature and functionality and more about, in many cases, just having products to sell people, right? And yeah. um, five years ago, we might've worried about keeping websites online during high traffic. Now it's like, how do we just you know keep our customer service teams happy so that they don't quit on us so that we can we can drive retention business and that's that's another area where we saw um probably the 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 second largest uh, amount of commitment for um uh for future spend i'm sorry the fourth largest amount of commitment for future spend uh was under customer experience um so Technology and infrastructure website and content were number one, two, and three. And those all kind of sound like they're in the same space. Customer experience was right behind that. Uh, and I think that that's where, you know, if 43% of business operators are looking to spend more on customer service or customer experience, um, they're, they're probably doing so in reaction to less foot traffic in store and looking to make those experiences better uh, overall. Um, but you don't get that by put sinking money into your website. Like you have to, um, right. you know, it, a lot of that's retention business. And so you have to really think about how, how you're spreading, like, you know, there's, there's, don't you wish that there was like a roller coaster tycoon for e-commerce? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, Oh yeah, it's, totally. It's, you know, it's like the, the, the role playing game aspect and scenario, you know, planning and sort of like optimization, like efforts of, you know, it's funny. Uh, I didn't mean to work this in here, but Toby, uh, Shopify, Toby, uh, Lutka, uh, had said recently, um, that his, his playing of like command and conquer and Starcraft is what has made him like a prolific business operator and that he understands the micro and the macro at the same time and how strategies and tactics work together to create like a cohesive plan of action and how to adapt when things don't go the way you think they will. I think that that's a really interesting take. Um, it is a really interesting take. Uh, another thing that I think this points back to is uh, actually our vision report from earlier this year. Um, very, very interesting. I feel like this is an acceleration of a lot of the things we thought would start to take hold this year. Um, this, this, this is speeding it up. Um, we talked about how this was, this was, you know, the year that that businesses f like finally, finally invest in the types of things that they need to invest in to to have a legitimate e-commerce business. And so, um, I just I think this is really COVID accelerated all of our predictions in really big ways. Um, and That's true. Fact, a side yeah. note, side note, like grand millennials, right? Like the whole <laughs> DIY, like learning a scale thing. Oh my gosh, like that was, I think, one of the last things we had in our predictions report. And like, that was probably our best prediction. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So you make a really good point there. Um, I've, I've referenced it maybe three times now. It had such a profound impact on me. But Scott Galloway um, had a, a really interesting interview with Kinsey Grant on the Morning Brew podcast about, uh, you know, COVID being an accelerant. And uh, COVID was an accelerant in... Uh, pretty much every area. It's like if you were a business that was going to go bankrupt eventually, it just happened faster. If you were a business that was going to skyrocket, skyrocket eventually during like you know over, because you were really well positioned in e-commerce, that happened faster. And if you are in education and <laughs> and you were well positioned to deliver digitally, then you would you know you, the online adoption and shift to digital for you happened much faster. And like then it probably would have otherwise like. All of those shift, all of those shifts were accelerants um, as as a result of the the channel shift in in into digital uh, for all kinds of reasons. But uh, you had written something, I think, in this section here that said if technology powers or even influences fifty percent of our transactions based on data. Um, so we, you know, we had um, uh, 
43% of uh, folks in our survey said that they were doing, uh, I'm sorry, of the folks, po- uh, consumers polled in our survey, uh, they in aggregate said that 43% of their shopping was done online prior to uh, COVID-19, uh, where 52% would be uh, retained or 52% would be doing their shopping uh, primarily online afterwards. So that's that's a 9% gain. And your your position here was basically if 50% of our transactions take place online or even influenced by online uh, interactions or experiences, then that means digital is your new flagship. And that's where you should be putting your investment. Um, I think that's and an I think, astute, I think, uh, astute point. Mr. I think Brian, that... I think. <laughs> well, thank you, Philip Jackson. Uh, <laughs> the... I think the the interesting thing here is as we see in continued investment into this space, that if you don't invest, that you're going to get left behind. That's kind of what I was trying to say earlier. Um, and I think it's crystallized as we got to this section. Investment in e-commerce is going to accelerate. And if you don't keep up, you will get left behind. <laughs> um so now is the time to be making those investments because you're going to be going along just fine. And then there's going to be like this moment where everyone else is ahead of you and you'll miss the, you'll miss the boat. Um, and so that, that's something that I think is a big cautioning point coming out of this is that if you're not investing more in e then you're, you're actually like, you're, you're missing out on the future. The, the, the un, like, can I just say how, like, how <laughs> we worked in somehow our partner gladly let us get away with probably the, the wittiest, uh, report we've ever written. Um, <laughs> true. I don't it's know true. how, like, thanks w- gladly. You thank are you. a great sponsor. <laughs> we, we, we love you guys so much. Thank you for being a great partner to us. We somehow simultaneously mention uh, weekend at Bernie's, uh, as in like brick and mortar is being propped up like a dead corpse, as a la weekend at Bernie's. We somehow said that and nobody got mad. Uh, we also said, uh, you know, we mentioned, uh, you know, we said pants are tyranny uh, and that people are, you know, doing Zoom calls without pants on. We, we've meant, we worked that in. Peter Pan gets a couple mentions. Um, it's, uh, it's a, and you know, we have uh, tiger King in, and, uh, tiger King is, is very, and, and toilet paper, uh, hoarding are mentioned on more than one occasion. It's a fun report. Um, let's talk about seasonality as a so- social construct. Um, yeah. This is where the pants something... are tyranny thing came in. And this that was true. also brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> pants are, pants are also a social construct. Uh, we, we have, we have we're in the middle of it right now with back to school, right? And we're, we're, we're currently working on an education report uh, that will land very soon. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're diving into this moment of uh, distance learning or in-person learning that will <laughs> dramatically shift to distance uh, online learning when things go awry. Um, this moment is, has taken the seasonality out of 2020, uh, we, we began the lockdowns in spring. We're going into the fall now. Uh, we're heading toward Labor Day here in the United States. Uh, we, we still have most states are not reopened in, in any official capacity. Um, yeah, it's, it's the dissolution of the social pact, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five. That's it's these, these things are, you know, our normal boundaries. Like what is summer if you can't go on vacation and what is, you know, what is back to school if kids don't need, you know, shoes and backpacks? Uh, so it's these these are things that drive retail purchase, especially things like travel and apparel uh, that are very locked to seasonality. Uh, we're, we're probably headed for a holiday season that is going to look unlike any that we have ever had. And that means that spending shifts around. So in our report, we outlined that 51% of consumers are spending more on groceries uh, now than before. And 7% are spending more on travel than before, but 78% are spending less. That's a shock, obviously. Uh, No one's traveling anywhere. (laughs) Um, But one thing that I think is really interesting is that uh, 48% say they're spending the same amount on digital entertainment. But... 35% are spending more. Right. And so it's a lot. 
Yeah. When you start looking at like one in three people are spending more on digital entertainment than they were before. Uh, one in two people are spending more on groceries than they were before. Uh, the experience economy has relocated back into the home. Um, think about this too. I, I almost guarantee you that 40% that are spending the same on digital entertainment were probably spending as much as they possibly could. Yeah, yeah. They were already <laughs> spending a tremendous amount of money on digital entertainment. And and they were probably right. spending it um, an equivalent amount, but in out-of-home experiences. Those things are being relocated now. You know, there's an interesting phenomenon here. Um, I, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to regret it because I'm I'm pretty sure that you don't have the same answer as me. Uh, you know, Disney plus will be releasing Mulan, uh, for $30, uh, come September 4th. I think it'll be over Labor Day weekend. Uh, Mm -hmm. is that something that you would buy in the Lang home? Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so surprised. Well, Elizabeth loves Mulan. Okay. So <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we just talked about this. We're totally going to buy <laughs> Is that something a year ago that you would have spent $30 on a digital download? You know? Oh, well, no, because we would have gone to see it in a theater. And so you would have spent have, how much at the theater? We would have spent boys? more than $30. <laughs> but so. a $30 digital download on top of a subscription service would have been untenable a year ago. Um yeah, so we did the same thing with uh, Onward. We bought Onward um, and a few other movies that we wanted yeah. to see. I think the new... We, we, we did the Jane digital Austin theatrical movie. or digital premiere. I, for, I forget what they called it for Trolls World Tour. We spent like 20 bucks to watch that twice. Yep. And yep. Um, those things are things we probably would have spent more money on out of home we're spending less overall, but it's the, the category has shifted. Channel is just yeah, the totally, channel is totally different. Right. Yeah. And actually, so that's something I wanted to bring up. And this is actually goes back to the last point more than anything else. The last uh, uh, section we talked about. Um, but this is, this is interesting looking ahead and I'm, I might do a whole article on this uh, or something, or just tweet about it or something. Yeah, yeah. I'll, have, I'll have you tweet about it. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> everybody who's who's been following us knows that I'm not a big Twitter person. Um, so I think that a lesson to be learned here that we should have put in the report, but I didn't realize until recently, is that you should have your toe in just about every channel that you can, even if it's not in a very good way. Here's why. Because... Even people that had some kind of e-commerce presence yeah. and were in the channels that they needed to be in, won when the channel shift happened. Yeah, and so having some kind of presence in those upcoming up and coming channels that you're like, why would I? I'm not going to make much money off that. Having something there is important coming up because you do not know what's coming down the pike. <laughs> this is going. Like, I, I think COVID kind of proves that out really, really well. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's something else here, too. This wasn't in the report, but you, you've, you've jogged my brain now. I, uh, I'm thinking about a tale of two shopping centers near my house. And there's a strip mall near my house, which has completely renovated the whole shopping center parking lot. Um, the first two spaces that are not handicapped spaces uh, that are closest to the shops are reserved throughout the entirety of the part of the, of the, the shopping center and they're reserved for in-car delivery. So every yes. single, every single company that has a store in there has the ability to, to deliver to their customers inside of the car for a contactless, you know, pickup. They don't have to get out of their car. They can pull up, they text a number, boom, it's done. And the shopping center across from that, which has more desirable stores has not made that investment. I think property owners uh, also play a role in helping brick and mortar uh, have the same kind of capabilities of like this, there's a new channel and it's the, you know, in-car delivery channel that is more uh, restrictive and more uh, it's incumbent upon property owners to also modernize and make the investment in there in that new channel as well. So I think like there, the channels aren't just digital channels. Yes. There's emergence of all kinds of like infrastructure channels that are things that are, you know, probably harder to control or harder to, you know, outside of your control that require investment uh, from, you know, the folks that you depend on. You've yeah. been saying it for months now, 
Best Buy curbside pickup. Yep. Who needed that before? But they had they were there. Yep. Yeah. And so all of a sudden it made a lot of sense and people started to use it much more frequently. Uh last point here in the uh in this section that I thought was really uh impactful was uh, and remember now, like we're saying this, we were saying this back in July when this uh, report landed. So uh, remember now, when you're listening to this now, and it's probably <laughs> September, uh, we were the first to say this. Uh, 37% of respondents in our consumer survey said that they will not resume flying for at least six months from now or until there is a COVID-19 vaccine. I think that indicates not only just a sluggish return for airline, hotel, and hospitality, but also like what the heck do the holidays look like in in 2020 are you going to buy a gift for for you know grandma and grandpa and nieces and nephews if you're not there to give it to them in person it, where is that going to happen is that also a shift like is that you know do those gifts now come in 2021 when you actually get to see them later do you send it through the mail is it going to be e-commerce is it just going to be saying hi to them on FaceTime or Zoom there's a lot of uncertainty of like the banality of a gift that just arrives in the mail. Like the real thing that you want is not to get a present. It's just probably to be with people. <laughs> and so right. uh, it, it just feels, it feels like the, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And also, we'll you know, see. we're coming some into people... Black Friday. Black Friday is actually quite a like selfish holiday to some degree. Like you wind up buying a lot of things that you probably were meaning to buy on your own. Uh, for yourself, but that's just me. Um, no, I think that's a really good point. Like there's a lot of, the, I think uh, some retailers caught on to that with the like, you know, buy one for someone else, get one for you, like promotions that started to pop up over the past few years. And um, we should, and and I think they should double down on that. I think that's an astute yes. point. Um, what is this? Then, num- it, what is it, number four? Like we got to get moving through the do, rest we of this report. Move on, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I can talk about this forever though. Um, totally. what, is, what is the Customer fourth experience. takeaway? It, customer experience is the only experience we have left, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I think I think was really really interesting and and on point. Um, you know, we've seen just a very like there's a very big mental health thing happening right now with COVID. People being isolated, people being alone, um, the and and not having as much personal interaction with people as they are not going out as much and they are like we back before we had our bubbles like it was very isolating now we have bubbles which i think is probably helping um but when you say bubbles think, what, do, what do you mean by bubbles sorry oh the, the the bubbles being like you have like a you know a few set uh like you have a small set of people that you do come in contact with oh oh, oh, oh of, yeah yeah yes. that's uh it's what i was calling your germ circle Oh. Your germ circle, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so that's that's probably true, but I, I think you know there's a lot of opportunity now more than ever, more than offering steep, steep discounts to try and retain customers, more than employing traditional tactics to try and gr- keep people engaged with your brand or bring them into their brand. Your customers are go- customers are going to remember how you treated them during this period. Um, and I think that 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 all by itself, like, is is going to change how the best customer co- um, companies interact with their customers, and and it's going to define and sort of be that refining fire that shows off who's actually good and who actually or who's actually good at treating their customers well, and who actually cares about their customers. Yeah, um, gosh, that's, this is this is your moment. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. I, I think that when, when you're looking at uh, customer experience too, and the way that you sort of like treat people with dignity, is that is where does that happen? Like, where where are you having those like more personal interactions? Like, is it through an AI chat bot? <laughs> and um, and by the way, if you run an AI chat bot and you want to, uh, uh, you know, give us a, a sponsor. Future Commerce, you can do that. You go over to futurecommerce.fm, scroll down to the bottom, <laughs> click on sponsor. Um, but the more personal experiences aren't the ones that are going to be automated or self-service. Uh, the ones that will define brands, right? And make generational brands are the ones that are inherently more personal. 
and and rely more on creating relationships and not necessarily like serving a need as fast as possible and as automated and self-service as possible. Well, and if you think about it with channel shift to digital, right, you used to have naturally more customer service representatives in your store because they were store associates. But it's true. W- what you need to do is start to think about the fact that you are, you're you like these digital transactions need people to support them just as much as any in-store interactions would. It's true. And, and, you know, there's, there's this uh, phenomenon that happens. Um, uh, I've seen it twice before. I can't say that I, you know, it's something that I'm, I'm well versed in. I've only been in e-commerce since uh, 2003 or four. Um, but I've seen it twice before in economic, uh, he's 40, he's turned 40. Oh my he's gosh. Turned 40. I hate you. Um, <laughs> uh, I am having a mini midlife crisis over it, but it's okay. Uh, we're going to be fine. We're going to be just fine. I promise. Uh, when, <laughs> in the two economic downturns that, uh, we've, I've, I've been in e-commerce through, uh, you know, and, and totally realizing that I missed the dot-com bust and also the uh, 2001 uh, uh, economic recession following 9-11. So, you know, I've only been around for a couple. Uh, but people don't necessarily pull back on on spend in the channel. Like, they don't decide that they're not going to do anything and, like, under-invest or, or decide not to invest. They just look to eke more profit out of it. They look for operational efficiency in these times. And so... Uh, uh, what I have seen or what my experience tells me is that rather than trying to drop, draw, uh, drive top line revenue, they can actually become more profitable in these moments by trying to drive bottom line revenue. And I think that's a, uh, you have to do both, right? You have to do both. Uh, but people get really serious, especially in, in, in the finance space, they get really serious about looking at where every dollar goes and making sure there's a return on those investments. Um, and they, they tend to do a lot less planning for the future. They look for a lot more return in the short term. Yes. And, and, and that, that, so I think that bodes well for us in digital and in, in, in this channel and that like people will continue to invest. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, customer service is the place where customers are telling us they want us to make that investment. And uh, four well, out of... And- Go ahead. I was just going to support it with some data. Yeah. Uh, four out of five of our respondents, 79% feel it's important that an online retailer are offering multiple ways to get in touch with customer service. So not just phone, not just, you know, online chat, not email, not ticket based support, but like all of it, plus probably text messaging and like, let me talk to a real human. And mm-hmm. if you do that, 33% has said that they will share a positive customer experience or have already shared a positive customer experience with other people. And so if you look at, at, at you know, you want to drive some efficiency in this time in an uncertain economic environment, you want to look for direct uh, uh, response, a strong retention business can be built on the back of customer experience. If you know what you're doing and you're, and, and by the way, like that will lower your overall total investment on what you're spending in digital uh, acquisition for and in PPC and in performance marketing. And, yes. and by the way, even on email volume send and the way that you in, interact with customers there too. If, if they're having great experiences with you, they will become your strongest proponents. What, so what you're saying is customer service is a customer acquisition strategy, it which is, is yeah. huge. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, I think that's like peak customer service that and like all we and top line revenue growth, uh, which if you have like, that's, that's like customer service nirvana. If you have the kind of customer service representatives that are, that are beyond customer experience, they're beyond, they're, they're looking to service the customer such that they, you know, can sell to them as well in a good way, like in, in a way that benefits that customer, it's going to help that customer. Like that's, that's like as good as it gets. Yeah. Um, but we, I know we're running out of time here. Let's maybe move on to our final point. It sounds like you had one more point here. Well, I was, I was going to give a, uh, I was going to give an anecdote of, uh, my experience, you know, I was, I worked at a, what you would now call a digitally native vertical brand. <laughs> I was early team at a, uh, a supplement company, um, that 
you know, did this. Like we had our own in-house customer service. We wrote our own content. We managed our own supply chain. We did our own fulfillment. Like we, we were a vertical brand who owned every part of the customer experience. And our call center very, very frequently had the highest retention and dro- drove the highest margin and also had a higher average order value than our digital channel ever did. And this is like before performance marketing was a thing. This is back in the age when people said social doesn't convert. This is before responsive web design and, and the app economy. It's, it's a truism, uh, it, regardless of what decade you're operating in, is that the personal touch and the actual like human connection with somebody can drive uh, real results and actually result in happier customers in the end. Um, all right, let's in move fact, on. In fact... <laughs> Now, this, now, now you're, is, yeah, go, go, go. Now more than ever is probably the time to invest in this because digital is such a, like a, a barrier. Like it is, it can be, can be so impersonal. Bringing that personal touch to digital is probably the, one of the best things you can do to it right now. Yep. Move it on. And if you're looking for a CX platform that makes a difference for <laughs> your business, uh, I want you to look no further. Why don't you check out Gladly? Gladly is the best. Gladly provides the, the, the kind of personal interaction that, you, that your customer really demands and, and requires of you. And uh, it's, it's no longer just like two-day shipping, uh, being personal in every channel and having an understanding of who your customer is and every interaction they have ever had with you is now a baseline customer requirement. You can get that to get. Yeah. You can get that. You can have that. It's super easy to do. And tons of brands are doing it, by the way from Porsche to Joanne Fabrics uh, to Crate and Barrel and even REI, brands of all sizes have chosen to put their customer experience and make every interaction personal with Gladly. They are the sponsor of today's episode and they are the sponsor of the Retail Rebirth Report. And uh, I super believe in them because their team is uh, radically personal and they want you to be radically personal too. Go check it out today at gladly.com slash future commerce. Okay. Last point, Mr. Brian Last J. Lang. Last point. Adaptability is your superpower. I'm super passionate about this because <laughs> this, it's this true. point, yes, this point, I mean, people think about adaptability as like being flexible and it is to some degree, like that's really, really important part of it. But what I think this really, like a really important point, I'm going to jump just to the takeaways before I come, mm-hmm. like we get through all of like the other stuff is that. I think this actually means planning more because you are going to fail in your strategy is to capture this moment and whatever that means for you. Like whether your sales are way down or they're way up, you're going to come up against some kind of a roadblock. Something that you're doing is not going to work. And the Brands and retailers that most capitalize on this moment are going to be the ones that had contingencies, that thought about additional options for how to address things when they came up. And so this doesn't mean just, oh, we're going to make decisions on a dime. This means thinking ahead and understanding how you can adjust to things. And yes, Sometimes the play breaks down and you have to go play some backyard ball. And I just threw in a football reference for no good reason. But yeah, I think that the best coaches create a playbook that that allows for responding to their opponent in the second half. <laughs> um, That's, I, I think you said it really well there. And, and you know, the report kind of puts it very nicely. It's like the, the plan is to fail because to fail is to be human. <laughs> like we, yes. Uh, things aren't going to work out the way that we plan them. We're not, you know, none of us are, uh, you know, as much as we call ourselves future commerce, we, we can't all predict the future, but we certainly can be ready for the future. We can try to have an impact and shape that future to be something we want it to be. Uh, but being adaptable and being able to be nimble in your business is probably the most important thing that you can, uh, that you can have. And this brings us back to our, our, our point. Uh, I think what we opened with, which is, uh, how, how inflexible a lot of legacy e-commerce platforms can be and how often those investments that have been made there are sort of, uh, 
created inflexibility and uh, lack of imagination in a lot of retailers. They may have been early adopters. And you look at like older, um, much older e-commerce platforms, one that no one minds us throwing under the bus. Uh, let me think of uh, one, WebSphere um, or Oracle mm-hmm. ATG. Um, when you think of like older e-commerce platforms that have been around for 10 years plus, uh, those are the ones that like the brands that are running those were early adopters in e-commerce and probably saw a lot of benefit out of that channel, but probably not a ton of return on investment because it was an expensive investment and the customer expectations weren't that they were driving, like, just like I said a minute ago, the, you know, the, the, at one point in time, it was pretty fashionable to say that social doesn't convert. I think you would have a hard time convincing anyone that that's the case today, right? Entire businesses are built on the back of social performance marketing. Times change. And uh, if you are still running on a legacy e-commerce platform, you probably aren't as nimble as some of the, the you know, those that are nipping at your heels. And so now is the time where you can, um, you know, you can, uh, being adaptable is your superpower. You need, you need to like get the radioactive spider and like <laughs> and give you some superpowers to be more nimble in that area of the business and be and way more sure flexible. Pick- pick tools to that allow you to be nimble. Yeah. That's, I think that's a really good point, Philip. Like those tools, your toolkit, your tool belt needs to be one that allows you to be flexible. Um, so that that's a really, really great takeaway. And I think we're coming up on that's time. That's it. Here. That's uh, that's all we've got. You can read more for yourself uh, at by just downloading the report. We want you to check it out and give us some feedback. I'd love to hear what you have to say, what your story of retail rebirth is in your business, where you're putting your investments Uh, or what your customers are telling you and what kind of investments you are making, uh, that would be super helpful. So download the report right now, futurecommerce.fm slash retail rebirth, or drop us a line, hello at futurecommerce.fm. And uh, we'd love to welcome you uh, into the fold and start a conversation with you. Uh, Anyway, uh, Brian, last word. Oh, thanks so much for listening. We we love that you listen to us and uh, we look forward to talking more with you and experiencing this with you. And um, we want to help shape the future with you as we talk about this. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye.